hope that you are eager to learn. I'm eager to teach. Uh, if you have your Bibles, if you'll go ahead and turn with me into the book of... Anybody know what we're studying? <laughs> We've been there for a while. But in Revelation chapter 13, I believe is where we left off last week. And uh, let me make a couple of announcements while you're turning there. Uh, by all means, let's remember, uh, there is no PM service this Friday. Uh, I mean, this Sunday night, we are going to have our district Thanksgiving service at the Somerville Church of God um, off of South Pine Street. Now, if you're unfamiliar with where that is, you can get with us. But all the districts are coming together um, to show thanks unto God, and, and try to get together as one. And so it has started at 5 o'clock, so it's an hour earlier than what we would typically meet. We also have, as you can see beside us or behind me here, the shoe boxes. If you haven't had a chance to turn those in, Sunday will be the last day because the National Pickup Day uh, for all of this concludes on Monday. And so I know several of you have in, uh, informed me that, hey, I did mine online, and that's great. Um, but if you haven't done it online and you still want to be able to help us reach our goal of 50, by all means, do so. Now, Sunday is also our Thanksgiving offering. Uh, and now let me just pause on that because this offering is not to replace your tithes. Uh, we know that tithes are first. This is a special offering that I feel the Lord has impressed on me for Thanksgiving. Now, when you give this, and, and the quantity of that, if I can phrase it in such a manner, uh, being impressed by the Lord, is to give an extra tithe check. It will go towards the replacement of our roof. Now, just to bring you a little up to date on that, I've had to go with a different attorney um, when we, in order to get the loan for the roof and stuff, and this one's moving a whole lot faster than the other one. I, uh, so by the end of this month, we should be closing with that attorney, and we'll be able to have the funds to replace this. But what does this do on the Thanksgiving offering? Well, it does a couple of things. Number one, it, it minimizes how much we have to pay out of pocket. But it also helps us uh, attribute that or, or funnel the money uh, that we would be getting for the roof that, to help replace some carpet. And as you know, if you go in the back, the carpet needs some replacing. And uh, the notion is this, that we should be taking care of God's house. And you know that, and I know that. Chick-fil-A actually has a motto that every seven years, uh, they have to remodel their whole facility. And so if you want to know, man, why do they keep going? It, because it's the attraction of modernization. And I'm not saying you got to remove all of this and do lights and smokes and all of that. But what I'm saying, it's a draw. And, and nobody wants to go to a building that looks run down. And so our job as the keepers of the house is to do our very best because it's part of the tools and this is just me speaking, it's part of the tools that I believe helps us reach the harvest, is that we can go out and say, hey, listen, you know that church right there? Oh, you mean the one with the grass nine feet high? And, you know, I don't even know if they should. Yeah, and that, that ain't what we want. We want a positive uh, affirmation of how we maintain our homes here at the house of God. And so that's where all of that is coming. So you'll, uh, and if you're like, man, preacher, I, you know, I can't have it this Sunday. Listen, there's the next Sunday. You know, there's the father. All you got to do is make roof on it. Just notate roof. You can do text to give, 73256. It'll send you a link, and, and Sister Wilma will know what to do with all of that. So listen, there are ways that you can give. Uh, if you're a millionaire, uh, you know, and you just need a tax write-off, uh, if you'll just contact us, we have places that you can give. Amen, somebody. <laughs> Amen. I can buy an ice maker that has a sonic ice in it. <laughs> Anyway, that's a, uh, that's a dream. Okay, so let's continue this. So Revelation. Now, we know that we're getting into uh, Armageddon. And Armageddon is an event. It, it, it's, it's something that's going to take place. And so we, we see this 
uh, we quickly pressed through uh, last week on Revelation chapter 13. And uh, I'm not exactly sure where we left off, so I'm going to hit 1313 just for the sake. But it talks about the beast. Now, I, I want you to understand there is the trinity of evil. Now, you may have never heard that expression, but the trinity of evil is this. So the beast, who is the beast? The devil. Who is the Antichrist? It's not the devil, okay? And, and, so, and then we have the false prophet. So we have a trinity of evil that's made up where we as Christians know of the trinity of the Godhead, the Father, Son, and the Holy Ghost. There is a trinity of evil, which is the beast, which is the Antichrist, and the false prophet. So when we look at all of that and we begin to see here in Revelations 13, 13, we immediately look at this and it says, He performs great signs, He being the beast, so that He can make fire come down from heaven on the earth and set His sights on men. He deceives whoever uh, dwells on the earth and He grants them to do what is great in the sight of the beast, telling those who dwell on the earth to make an image to the beast. So now the the beast, Satan, Lucifer, is trying to get those that remain to make an idol. Now, what is one of the Ten Commandments? Thou shalt worship the Lord God, thy God. There, you should not be creating idols. But we have the beast, and so the beast in, in his obviousness would create or want a creation of, a, of an idol, a, a makeup of something to be worshipped in his image. Now, we also see this that takes place in Daniel. We see the king that's made this thing, and he wants people to worship him. So the enemy is very in tune about the physicalness of what you worship. It is on a rarity, if ever, that you will see the push of the enemy trying to get you to worship something you cannot see. Because the enemy understands that we all are enticed or intrigued by what we see. It, it, how many of you sees a fire truck go down the road with his lights on, the federal blowing, and you just be like, don't even hear it. If you're like me, I want to hop in the car, and I want to go see where it's going. And when it comes into my neighborhood, and if it goes this way, I, I, I'm, I, I want to still jump on my bike at that point <laughs> and be able to ride down there. No need to burn gas. But the idea is this. Look, at the end, it says, And those who dwell on earth to make an image to the beast who was wounded by the sword and lived. So now all of a sudden, I want you to memorialize me that somebody tried to kill me, but I'm not dead. And the beast is trying to entice. And the reason he's trying to entice is because he knows there's not much time for me. We know Scripture, and it says that no man knows the day nor the hour. We know that the time is coming that we are going to leave earth and meet Jesus in the air. We sing that song soon and very soon. We are going to meet the king. Listen, it's not going to be long that we're going to leave this earth. You know, we're going to go and we're going to have a grand old time. But can I just tell you something? I'm on a soapbox. There's no party in heaven. They're, 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 you're not going to drink a beer with Jesus. I know there's a country song out there. I think it said, you know, having a beer with Jesus or something like that. Listen, it, 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 that's false. And again, understanding where music comes from. Lucifer was over music in heaven. So the reason it's so enticing and the reason it's so seductive and the reason it's so uh, alluring is because he understands the powerness of music. And so the beats, oh, you know, I'm just listening to the beats. And, and you, you know, listen, there's nothing wrong with beats of music. 
But I want you to understand something. In the sorcery world, in the, the evil world that you and I live in, there are what is called chants. And chants are done by beats. And so when we look at this and say, oh, you know, I'm just listening to the music, be very careful that you're not opening up the gateway of your mind into a mental chance based off of the, the beat or the rhythm of the music. And if I could pull a secular song and, and, and really tie this in, the rhythm is going to get you. you. You know that song. I, now I got it stuck in my head, so I got to sing Precious Lord, Take My Hand or something to get it out. But what I'm saying is the rhythm is going to get you. And it's, and it's bothersome to me because the church ha has gotten away from its holiness standard when we talk about Christianity in the music and when, what we watch and what we do. I was a part of the youth camp here in South Carolina in the PD region, and, and, and here's what was going on, Brother Brad. We asked the young people, when you have a hard day, for those of you that turn on Christian music, I want you to come over here. And for those of you that turn on secular, I want you to come here. Now, in almost three to 400 students that were there that day on the teams, I'm sad to say that the majority of those did not come to the Christian side. They went to the secular. Why? Because there's a drawing, there's a feel-good, and the problem is that we don't know enough feel-good Christian songs that all we go is we revert back to what we know or what we know to have felt good at some time. They're called comfort songs. They're, they're, they're the, the turn to uh, things, and oh man, this is really, and this is where the allurement of the enemy gets those that dwell even now here on earth. Oh, I'm just listening to the beat. I don't even pay attention to the music, to the words. But listen, can I tell you whether you subconscious or consciously pay attention to the words, subconsciously you still do. It's still embedded in you and I. And, and so we got to be very careful again about the things that we put in. Look at verse 15. He was granted power to give breath to the image of the beast, and the image of the beast both should both speak and cause as many that would not worship the beast to be killed. Now, all of a sudden, again, we're going back to a reference of Daniel. And Daniel and the three Hebrew children, if you don't worship the image, you're going to die. And again, this is going, getting us close to the mark of the beast, where if you don't worship, you're going to die. If you don't take the mark, you're going to die. Why is this? Because the beast is only concerned about death. The beast is not concerned about life because he knows he's going to die. Why would I entice you with life? Why would I entice you with those things when I know that I myself is going to die? So the greatest thing that I can do is give you a fear of death and it cause you to follow me because you think this is your redemption path or to think that if you worship me in this manner that I won't bring forth damnation unto you. But again, it is a lie of the enemy. The enemy wants you to believe that as long as you serve him, that God is righteous. you got plenty of time so to to get your heart right. But you don't. Again, no man knows the day nor the hour. And if no man knows the day nor the hour, that means, listen, I I'm going to upset somebody, I know. But that means your favorite TV preacher that says God told them that the world's coming to an end in 2024 is a lie. Because no man knows the day nor the hour. Why would God... In the emphasis of him, say that no man knows the day nor the hour. Reveal unto man, the humanistic side of man, a day that 
now all of a sudden, if everybody wanted to play their cards right, if you were lost and dying and going to hell, and you knew that November the 30th in 2022, God's coming back, what would you do on November the 21st or 29th or whatever date I said 30th, the 29th? What would you be doing? I'm going to tell you what I would do. Now, Brother Joey, this is just me. If I was not living right, I would do all sin that I could up to the day before I'm told God is going to end this earth. Now, that's playing Russian roulette, but listen, in my, in my understanding of the mind, I'm thinking I got a week left to do all the sin I want to. Then I will ask God to come into my heart, wipe away all my sin, and I'm good to go. That's foolishness. Because again, you are playing this Russian roulette with your soul because Scripture says that no man knows the day nor the hour. You could get in your car, drive out of the parking lot of this church and get to that crazy intersection up there and die. The pleasures of sin is only for a season, and that means the season must come to an end. But the enemy's not going to tell you that. Look at this in verse 15 again. And he says that he would that he would worship the image of the beast. Now listen, in verse 16, he causes all both small and great, rich and poor, free and slave to receive a mark on their right hand or on their forehead. Now again, we're getting to the mark of the beast. There is no There's no one exempt from this. Look, both great and small, rich and poor, free and slave, they will have to receive the mark. Now, the mark is a very interesting thing because it's going to be the the access code, if you will, for life or death, to buy or sell, to eat or not eat. Because if you don't have the mark, you're going to die. And so all of these people that are out there in this world, that's, you know, here's what's happening. The enemy is getting the church world accustomed to anything and everything so that when it comes a requirement, you don't fight it. Growing up, if you and I, you know, I grew up in a church that no facial hair. You're going to hell if you got facial hair. Well, Jesus had his beard plucked. Uh, you, you know, the Bible didn't say how long he went without shaving. <laughs> you, you know, uh, but the custom of those days was to have a beard. Maybe not like the Robinsons. All full, and you know, I mean, there was this this era of wanting to look respectful and, and decent, and, and but so here, here's what we got going on. Then you turn into about 20 years ago. Well, let's see, I'm older than that. Let me go to the first one. So about 32 or 33 years ago, I was in Texas, Kansas, Arkansas, brother Smoke. We was at a Walmart. And the man before us was getting groceries. And it was back when they would ask you, you know, cash, check, or charge. And he said, I don't have any of that. And the woman was like, sir, I'm sorry, you know, how are you going to pay for this? And he takes his hand and he runs it over the scanner, which happened to be built into the cashiering, you know, it's back in those days. And it immediately subtracted money out of his bank account and paid for it. And he tells the cashier, I'm one of 200 people doing an experiment of cashless society. Now, that was 30 years ago. I can take you about 20 years ago, probably further than that, but 25. The YMCA in Sumter, in order to get in, they went away from the ID cards, uh, Sister Sherry, and they went with a finger scan. And again, getting us accustomed to anything and everything. And you think, well, this is a Christian organization. 
You, you know, surely some balk that. This is the mark of the beast, you, you, you know. But again, I believe that the, the mark is actually going to have some information on it. I think it's going to like, uh, like a barcode that they can scan and they'll know everything about you. It's going to be more than just uh, the, the number six. Now, this is just me and some of the studies that I've done. That 666, yes, we know that's the mark of the beast. But within it can be a barcodedness uh, like a QR code that we have in today. And when you scan that QR code, it takes you anywhere and everywhere. So they'll know everything about you. To, to know maybe where your alliance is, knowing all of these things, and it's a world of information overload. The enemy's going to, listen, how are we going to buy stuff? Well, listen, it, you can't, it's a releasing. When, so when I have this mark on me, now I'm released to go anywhere and everywhere. And so I, if I don't have it, I can't buy. I can't sell anything. I can't go into certain places because I don't have the mark. And so here's what takes place. Look at verse 17. And that no one may buy or sell except one who has the mark or the name of the beast or the number on his, of his name. Here is wisdom. Watch this. Let him who is understanding calculate the number of the beast, for it is the number of a man his number is 666. So when we look at all of this, 666 used to be this thing. Let's say, hey, do you mind rounding that up for me? But now people just have it as a running joke. Why? Because in the world that we live in, the enemy is downplaying the significance of the number. And the reason it's happening is because we have less and less people coming to church. We live in a illiterate, a biblical illiterate society. They can't quote the scripture. It used to be when I was growing up and coming up through school, we had, you know, I, was, I went to a Christian school starting off, and we had to quote scripture. The early parts of my Christianity in, in our Sunday school class, and we had youth on Sunday nights, every Sunday night at 6 o'clock, and we studied scripture and then the regular service at seven now we can hardly get people to church one time a week you can't get them here for a life group because well i can't do both well if your life depends on it you can but it's going to have to become important to you and the problem is, here's what takes place. It has been stated that what one generation does in moderation, the next does in excess. And so let's take this. In the generation that I lived in, church become less and less important. Now the new generation coming up, doesn't see church as a necessity. Why? Because it was never demonstrated to them of the importance. We have less and less paying tithes, and it's not about the money. It's about the biblical mandate. I can go through tithes. I can go through prayer. I can go through reading of the Bible. I can go through anything that you want to talk to about the religious side of the house and show you that because the generation before this upcoming Generation Z, Gen Z as they call it, is finding less and less about Christianity, but there's a hunger in the Generation Z. The Gen Z has a hunger because they want a genuine experience from God. They don't care about denomination. If God's moving in the Baptist, that's where they want to be. If God's moving in the Church of God, that's where they want. All they want is a genuine experience of the Church of God. Or, or the church in general, not the church of God. And, and so why is that so important? Because I want you to understand that you and I have this importance that we have to ensure that our faith is strong, that should we be left behind? Should we not go up in the pre-trib, now all of a sudden we have to have enough faith to stand against receiving the mark? Can you do it? Can I do it? And let me tell you how 
the enemy. This is not going to be a yes or no situation. I believe that this is how it's going to go. I believe in what we talk about, the torments. I believe that you're literally going to begin to see the church having to push itself underground. I believe that we're going to begin to see, now now listen, this is just me, because I, this is what society and biblical his, history has shown, that when a wicked world has the predominance, that all of a sudden wickedness, sexual immorality, and all of that begins to take place. What happens when one tribe or one army group goes and attacks another? They take the children, they take the women, and they kill the men. I believe as this world gets worse and worse, we're going to see within the Christian ranks a challenge of our faith. We're going to begin to see individuals coming in that's going to take away the the religious freedom that we want to claim to have, the religious freedom. We're not going to have the Bible like we have it now. And then we're going to go a step further in the persecution of the saints that we're going to find ourselves in a very peculiar situation that we're going to have to really exercise our stance off of. And I'll use my family as an example. I believe that the longer that we're here, and if God don't hurry up and come back, that we're going to reach a boiling point in America that somebody's going to bust through that door or my door at the home and ask me to denounce God or they're going to kill my kids and rape my wife. And you can holler the Second Amendment, I'm going to shoot. Listen, you ain't going to have time for that. You're going to have to be able to stand and say, I want to be with God. It's going to, listen, it was wicked back in the biblical days, and we're only getting worse. And so listen, this is why, again, this is why Scripture tells you and I that we should be mourning when somebody is born and rejoicing when somebody dies. That's one less person that has to endure the sinness of this world. So let's let's look at this. Go into verse 1 of chapter 14. The Bible says, and then look, I behold a standing on the Mount Zion, a lamb standing there, and with him 144,000, having the Father's name written on their foreheads. How about that? You have the mark of the beast at the end of chapter 13 on the the forehead of the mark of the beast of the number of man, 666. And now we go into Revelation chapter 14 and straight off the bat, John is telling us that he sees a lamb on Mount Zion here with a mark on the forehead of the 144,000. Why is that significant? Because verse 2. And I heard a voice from heaven like the voice of many waters and like the voice of a loud thunder, and I heard the sound of a harpist. There's a new song, verse 3. There's a new song. Before the throne and before the four living creatures and the elders, and that no one could learn that song except the 144,000 who were redeemed on the earth. Now, I don't want to jump too far ahead here, but this is a, 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 an introduction that we're getting into. The religious, there's a religious group out there that thinks only 144,000 are going to make heaven, and that's a lie. If you ever run across one of those, just ask them, how do we know that we're going to be 144 or not? And they'll tell you that it's been predetermined. And as old as this world is, and as many as people that have come to the understanding and the knowledge of Jesus Christ from the Old Testament to the New Testament and beyond, you're going to tell me that as many lives that were changed by the ministry of Billy Graham and all these other phenomenal ministers and even those that nobody ever knows that God only prepared room for 144,000. For Christ says... I must go to prepare a place for you that where I am you may be also. For in my Father's house are many mansions. He wasn't just talking to 144,000 people. 
Jesus says, for God so loved the world. Why would he turn around and say only 144,000 are going to make it? It is a lie. It is a false interpretation of the scripture. And we need to be prepared for this. We need to understand that this is a, a religious uh, sect out there in the world and, and, and hope maybe coming into this new year I can maybe do a teaching on all the different religions that are out there to kind of help prepare us on maybe how to uh, address them. Now, we're not knocking all religions, but there are some religions, Jehovah's Witness and others, that, listen, they're, they're just false, but we look at this place, and there is a song, and the Scripture says that it cannot be learned. 144,000 are going to know this song. But listen, look at verse 4. These are the ones who were not defiled with women, for they are virgins. These are the ones who follow the Lamb wherever he goes. These were the redeemed from among the men, being the first fruits of God of the Lamb. Now, you have to understand that when we're walking all of this out, these are the ones that have separated themselves. These are the ones that are getting to this place. These are the uh, uh, elect, if, if you can phrase it that way, but these are the ones that's going to help minister the gospel of Jesus Christ. And, and, and it's important to understand that God holds uh, an importance to those that follow him. It's not as if somehow in God's omnipotence and his omnipresence that he just ignores those that have dedicated their life to him. Now, I want you to, if you will, we're going to jump for just a moment. I want you to look at verse 14. In Revelation chapter 14, we, we see a passage that takes place. I'm going to read to the end of verse 20. And the Bible says, And then look, I behold a white cloud, and the cloud sat one like the Son of Man, having his head on a, a golden crown, and his hand a sharp sickle. And another angel came out of the temple, crying with a loud voice to him who sat on the cloud, Thrust in your sickle and reap, for the time has come for you to reap, for the harvest of the earth is ripe. So he who sat on the cloud thrust in the sickle on the earth, and the earth was reaped. Look at verse 17. Then another angel came out of the temple, which is in heaven, and he also having a sharp sickle. And another angel came out from the altar, who had the power over fire. And he cried with a loud cry to him who had a sharp sickle, saying, Thrust that sickle and gather the clusters of the vine of the earth, for the grapes are fully ripe. Another angel comes and he, and he thrust it into the earth and gathered the vine of the earth and threw it into the great winepress of the wrath of God. So the winepress was trampled outside the city. The blood came out of the winepress and up to the horse's bridle for 1,600 furlongs. So again, we're seeing the event of Armageddon take place. Verse 15 announces who's sitting on the throne. And, and we see this take place. But that very last verse in number 18, and it says, For her grapes are fully ripe. I want you to understand that there is still going to be a harvest. Jesus makes reference to you and I that the harvest is plenty, but the workers are few. There's an obligation for you and I to become workers. But we got a lot of lazy people in the church. We got people in the church that only want to work if they can be on the platform. Now, I call it a platform and not a stage because a stage is where performance takes place. And if we think that we need performers up here, we have missed what church is all about. I would rather have people that have less talent and anointing than talented people with no anointing. 
Why? Because there comes a time that the singers and the preaching and the laity within the church comes together and helps those that are hungry and thirsty and need feeding and need help out into the community. And all if we're in tune with is look at my talent, you'll get nowhere. Talent's a time a dozen or a dime a dozen, not a time a dozen. The problem is it's hard to find anointed people. Because anointed, to be anointed, let, let me help you, to be anointed, you have to be in line with God. You can't be anointed and do secular stuff and Christianity stuff. Meaning you can't play in the bars on Friday and think you're going to bring some anointing on Sunday. It's not going to happen. You can't sit and do things that are detestable unto God and then all of a sudden stand as if you were a leader or a teacher or even a laity within the house of God and think somehow that you're going to help bring anointing to a service. You and I must line up and be pressed by God. The wine press. There has to be a point in your life and in mine where we are pressed and the sin nature is forced out so that there is an empty capacity for the spiritual nature to be put in. But if all we're in tune with is, well, I like what I do during the week and I'll come and lift up my hands on Sunday, can I just tell you you're a hypocrite? And it, whether you're the preacher, whether you're the life group leader or director, it doesn't really matter. Whether you're a singer, doesn't really matter. The enemy wants hypocrites in the church because he understands that the more hypocrites he can highlight within the church, the less anointing the church has. I want a church that is anointed. I want a church that's not afraid to go through the wine press of God because we know that God's forcing things that are unnecessary out of us so he can pour in the necessities in us. Because there comes a moment that somebody's life is going to be depending on me. Listen, Galatians 6 and 7 says this, Do not be deceived. God is not mocked. For whatever a man sows, that will he reap. What does that really mean, preacher? Well, I'll tell you my interpretation. This is Houston Commentary, page 103. It means simply this. Don't let man deceive you. Don't think that everyone that you look at is spiritual or anointed. Because there's enough church playing. You may not see it right away, but the Bible's clear. Do not mock God. Well, preacher, what about the little kids? Listen, there's some naiveness and some hunger about that. When I was growing up, yeah, we could play church. We could do all the Pentecostal helicopters. We could do all of that. I think there's some innocence in that. The point that it comes is when you do it for attention to make yourself seem more spiritual than what you are. And can I just tell you that people recognize deadness. If you're dead, people are going to know it. But the world somehow, listen, you can look at whether they're TV preachers or whether they're in the pews or whether they're not. There's a reason some people don't come to church. And I know they blame it on the hypocrites, but we know there's hypocrites out there. The problem is really this. The problem is that there are too many people that are allowed to do things in the house of God without accountability because they are deceiving And there's no discernment. And so here comes, well, I won't use Brad because he's always sitting right there. So we'll we'll look at John John over here. And, and, And John John's been coming to church, and we think, man, John John's gonna be great with this group. 
because, man, he's always at church. But just because you're always at church don't mean you're saved. Just because you're always at church doesn't mean that you're the right person for a position. And so the challenge that you and I have to do is to develop righteous workers for the kingdom of God. I want to work. I don't need a, I don't need a title. I don't have to have pastor in front of my name to go preach the gospel. Because the first mandate that you and I received was to go into all the world and preach the gospel. It did not say all preachers. Because truth be told, a preacher is just a messenger of God. Now, pastoring is a different story, but preachers are a messenger of God. You have a message to share. And if God has saved you, welcome to the ministry. Because you have a message to share. Somebody needs to hear your testimony. Somebody needs to know what God has done for you. But listen, whether a man sows into sin or sows into righteousness, he is going to reap it. If you sow bad things, well, you reap bad things. If you sow in the wrong uh, area, you're going to reap. I don't know why that thing is always, you, you know, well, where is your heart at? Where are you putting your energy? Listen, and this can be for anything. So not just within the Christianity, it could be within maybe your job force. If your heart is not in it, right now, uh, some of you may know a, a, a guy by the name of Elon Musk. He just purchased Twitter. I'm not on it. So, but anyway, he just purchased it for, four, uh, I think it was $54 billion or $44 billion. Now, I know y'all know that kind of money. Y'all got that sitting around, you know, but that's a lot of money. But right now, the shareholders of Tesla, who he happens to be the owner of, is suing him because they have orchestrated a payout before him of $54 billion dollars. And they don't think he's giving adequate attention to Tesla because he's spending more time in the Twitter headquarters. Now, why do I bring it? Because it tells a lot of one's heart where they're always at. And if you're playing church on Sunday in the world Monday through Friday or Saturday, it tells me where your heart is. Because you're spending more time in the world, you cannot advance spiritually. We need warriors. It is equipping of the saints. That's what the fivefold ministry is, the purpose of a prayer. It's to equip the saints. And so if we're equipping, then now all of a sudden, we got to build warriors. You should be building warriors, an army within your life group. Sister Wilma, Brother Brad, you, you know, uh, we can go across the board. Everything that we do, whether it's in the youth, whether it's in the children, whether it's from the platform, whether it's me preaching, everything that we do should be building up the army of God. But if the trainers are bad, they'll never produce good soldiers. And don't get me wrong, there's always one that can break through the cracks, and you, you know, but what I'm saying is this, that we have an obligation to be strong. Many people ask the question, why doesn't God do something about this evil that's going on, the deceptive? Well, the passage is doing something. Look, the passage is doing something. I, I want you to look at verse 4. Those are the ones who were not defiled. So, so God is this long-suffering God. And if you jump and begin to look with me again back at verse 14, and he talks about the one sitting, and we see this thrusting of a sickle that's going in and this purging that's going in. God is a patient God. How would you have liked it if the moment that you messed up, God condemned you to hell? Nobody's perfect. Today, we probably have committed some sin in our life. I hope you're doing really good in, in trying to minimize it, but we're human. 
And whether it's a bad attitude, whether it's carrying some gossip, whether whatever the case may be, but the reality is this, that we complain, why isn't God doing something? And sometimes when we don't see God doing something, he's still doing something, and we just don't like it. Why do bad things happen to good people? Because sin is in the picture. God is still in control, yes. But if God only gave you and me good things, we would be rotten people. you got to endure infliction because if not, how could you ever relate to the persecution of the Son of God? He received his death because he preached a message that was contrary to the world. And we are going to be persecuted because we preach a gospel contrary to what the world wants to hear. So God is extending the grace and the mercy to the thousands and has been doing so for thousands of years. Let me just put it to you this way. If God was the God of the Old Testament and exercised everything like that today, we would be a scared society. The moment we met, oh, somebody's going to die. See, I grew up in an era that we didn't lock our doors. Windows could be open in the middle of the night because we're just trying to cool off and you had no concern that somebody was going to break in. You could leave the door open. You you could, it it was just, there was none of this concern factor. Some of that was because of the death penalty, the firing squad. And we knew that if we messed up, we're going to meet death. There was a punishment to match the crime. Now we live in a society that they're reducing all, well, you know, we're overcrowded. Well, if we would punish those that need to be punished. I understand there's some innocent people in jail, and I feel sorry for them and and hope one day we can rectify that. But the reality is this, that there are some that deserve to be there, and, and the extenuations of multiple appeals, knowing that they have committed a crime, there must be payment. But if we want to be so dogmatic there and so hardcore there, then we got to also carry that into the church and be able to say, listen, you know, God's extending mercy and grace to us. He hasn't sent me to hell yet. I broke the speed limit coming home. I violated the law of the land, and God could have sent me to hell. God's not a petty God. The reason I'm not in hell because of me going one mile above the speed limit is because we serve a merciful God. Could you imagine going to hell because you went 56 in a 55? Then you say, now, preacher, that's what Jesus said to obey the laws of the land. That would mean, let's, let's just, let me terrify you. That would mean if you're riding in your car and you don't have a seatbelt on, and you get in a wreck and you die, you violated the laws of the land. And if God was a terrible, terrible God, and he just said, well, you didn't follow my going to hell over no seatbelt. I'm grateful that he looks at the heart. That that's what matters. But see, listen, when your heart is right, you don't want to be defiant. You cannot be acceptable to the ways of God and so defiant to the ways of men because Christ said, give unto Caesar what is Caesar's and unto God is what is God. What was he saying? There comes a point that you need to be respectful, but if it contradicts biblical standards, you got to have a stand. And that's where we look at the mark. That's where we look at whether it's the mark uh, of the, the Son of God on the 144 or 1,000 or in, in this year. But look, what I'm trying to get to is this, is that we have seen over the last 2,000 plus years in the church a rebellious nature. And they're rejecting God constantly. 
And the church seems to be okay with it. But I'm not. I'm not okay with the church rejecting a God that blood that bled and died for us. There has to come a point, a turning point, if you will, because Jesus promised that he would return to earth and take the people with him. But he's not taking the rebellious people. He's not taking those that rejected him. Be like, oh, wait, God, I, you, you know, listen, when you see the dead in Christ rising and maybe you're, you know, uh, I don't know, maybe you're on a fishing boat. <laughs> you know, we just went, and all of a sudden, yeah, it's not going to be one of those where they're coming up and be like, Ooh, you know, it's not ghostly, okay? Before you can even think about what's going on, those that remain with God are going to go. You're not going to have time to say, wait a minute, God, save my soul. Am I trying to scare you? Absolutely. But it's not a scared in the, in the sense that I want you so scared that you don't fully commit to God. I don't want you left behind. And my job is to preach the gospel. Listen, we know this in, in John 14. Listen to what Jesus says. Let not your heart be troubled. You believe in God, believe also in me. In my Father's house were many mansions. If it were not so, I would have told you. I want to pause right there because I want you to understand that when God says something, we take it at face value. You don't have, God is, you don't have to read anything between the lines with him. So God says, listen, don't be troubled. If you believe in God, believe in me. I'm the son of God, so you got to believe in me. But in my father's house are many mansions. Now, mansions can be looked at in one or two ways. It can be looked at as a, a house with many rooms, like the smoke family's house. I'm just kidding. <laughs> It could be like, like a hotel, or it could literally be a mansion. But whether I have a room or a mansion doesn't matter. I just won't be there. You know, it, it doesn't matter. I, you know, just hope I like my neighbors. <laughs> if you don't, you're not going. <laughs> but listen, he goes on and he says this. I go to prepare a place for you. And if I go to prepare a place for you, I'm going to come again. What a great promise. I believe the construction of the mansions are about complete. And I believe that we're going to about to hear the trumpet of God sound. I believe we're going to hear some rumbling that takes place and that's the dead in Christ coming six feet under and to be able to go with them once they crest the ground and immediately we go and all together as one meet our Lord and Savior what a day glorious day that will be but some people are not going to be happy there's going to be chaos in this world. There's going to be issues floating around, and I don't want you left behind. I don't want to be left behind. And so we have a message that we have to carry. And that message is simply this. Did Jesus mean what he said? And if we say yes, then it also means that the message that he wants us to carry has to be spoken not secretly hid. You have a light to carry. It's time for you and I to begin to disperse the darkness of this world and say, okay, God, light my candle. I want to make a difference. I want you to bow your head. Father, today, as we reflect 
In a Thanksgiving season, Lord, I'm thankful for the life that you lived, the example that you set. I'm thankful for the Father that you are, how you care, how you provide, how you protect, and how you persevere within us. There's a line that you want us to cross, and it's not a good or bad line. It's the finish line. And we're in a race. It doesn't matter how fast we run. The line only appears when you say it does. So let us not be fainting along the way, but let us persevere. Let us be at a place that we are willing to take a stand. A place that we're really to stand up for the kingdom of God and be able to declare even now, I am a son or a daughter of the Most High. And should death come to my door, I will die for the one that died for me. And Lord, I don't know in the midst of everything that life has presented itself, the condition of the hearts of your people. But surely as a shepherd, I don't want anyone left behind. So Lord, would you protect us and keep us? Would you search us even today and see if there be any wicked ways in us that we might be able to be sons and daughters of Jesus Christ without spot, wrinkle, or blemish? That when the trumpet sounds, we get to meet you what a day glorious day that will be strengthen us protect us let us be solid workers for the kingdom of God bringing the loss to you while there's still time now as we go our separate ways father I ask that you bless us keep us would you minister to us Would you come and strengthen us this week? And as we enter into the week of Thanksgiving, would you let us be reflective on the things that we're truly grateful for? This we ask in your most holy name. Amen and amen. God bless you. Have a wonderful week. Don't forget, Sunday afternoon, we will be going to the Somerville Church of God on South Pine Street for our district Thanksgiving service at 5 o'clock. I hope you'll join us. God bless you.